lovely library lions, it's Danny, and today I'm going to do my February wrap up. I didn't read quite as much in February as I managed to in January. I'm going to say that it's because February is a short month. So today I'm just going to go through the six books that I read in February and tell you a little bit about what I thought about them. The first book that I read in February was The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. So this was a huge release that everyone was super excited for last year and I didn't get to it till now. Um, I was really excited for it because I love V.E. Schwab's other works and I was so excited to see another adult um, work coming out from her. And the premise for this was so cool. I love the idea that a girl made a deal with the devil and it went slightly wrong as deals always do and then that she has to figure out how to live her life through that. I thought it was a really beautiful book. I like that it spanned such a long period of time and that we had little snippets from sort of centuries about Addie's life and what it's like to live where you can live forever but you can never make a mark and is that really living? Is that really a life if no one can ever remember you? I really liked when it went into how she had relationships with people where she would remember them and be with them for months but they would meet her again every day and it was kind of sad. <laughs> um, I didn't really like the sort of main love interest that appears but I loved um, Luke and the way that he stayed with Addie over the centuries and I know that he is not a great person, that he's obviously meant to be bad but I really liked the relationship between him between him and Addie and how it developed. I liked seeing their banter, how they sort of learned to work around each other, how even though he's this immortal, sort of all-powerful being, um, Addie kind of learned to play, play games with him and learned how to develop sort of not quite a love but something with him that felt like a real relationship because at least he could remember her. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the ending. I thought that especially sort of the epilogue should have been left out um, I thought it was a much more beautiful story if it had more of an ambiguous ending. I didn't like the the way that it came back in after the epilogue and sort of said exactly what Addie was planning to do. I would have liked it if she had just sort of disappeared and that was it. I know other people wouldn't have, but sort of not the ending that I wanted from this book. So I thought that it was a really good book up to that point. I still thought it was worth five stars, um, but yeah, it kind of fell off at the end and I wish she would have done something a little different with it at that point. I still think it's really worth reading. I'm probably going to put it on my bookshelf with my other favorites. It is a really pretty cover, even though it's very minimalistic. And I really enjoyed reading this. The next book I read in February was actually a read-along that I did with uh, Beautifully Bookish Bethany and Bookish Realm. There's a lot of people doing it. I'll link to the read-along down below. So it was Alana, The First Adventure by Tamora Pierce. So I've been wanting to get into her books for a long time. She's sort of one of the big fantasy authors that sort of started or was very important during the start of the, the YA genre and one of the first really big female authors that I've heard about. And I really wanted to read her work. I did find it interesting that in the back she sort of includes a story about her journey to publication and how she wanted the Song of the Lioness Quartet to be an adult series and she ended up getting pushed more into YA middle grade. And it is a very middle grade book, but it covers so many important topics. It talks about sex, it talks about periods, sort of going through into womanhood. And it does it in such a progressive way for the time that it was written that I was I was so shocked. I was like, I would have loved to read this when I was young. It talks about how women should enjoy sex, how like periods work. So many things you don't expect to see in even middle grade books nowadays, much less when this was published. I also just loved her relationship with all the boys in the book because she um, trades places with her twin and her twin goes to be a mage and she goes to be a knight, which is only boys typically. So she develops all these friendships with these boys and it's so nice to see her just being friends. She has different father figures and she just develops all these complex relationships with characters that you know are going to come back throughout the quartet. Um, I'm really a George fan. I really liked him. He's sort of this thief that she meets and becomes close with and she he's one of the first people who knows that she's actually a girl and she's Alana, not Alan, which I thought was really cute. Um, and I also like her relationship with John, how it's sort of still a friendship, but it could become a romance. We don't know yet, but he trusts her so much throughout the book, and I thought that was beautiful. Um, again, it deals with so many important topics. It covers some bullying stuff and how how to sort of overcome a bully. Um, and it's really beautiful that Alana sort of doesn't like hurting people. And when she does defeat her bully, she says, I did it. Said so he'd stop picking on me, but I don't feel good about beating him up. It makes me feel bad afterwards. And I think that's important. For kids to read. I think this is a great book for kids. Um, again, just so many important things are covered in it and it's really fun. Even as an adult it was a really fun read. It's super fast to read. It's only about 200 pages. 
Um, so it is a really quick read. It's very well written, and I think it holds up. Even though it was written such a long time ago, it still holds up today. I also read A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, which is the sequel to An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, both by Hank Green. Um, they formed the Carl's Duology, so this is the final book. I unfortunately didn't like it as much as I liked the first book. I still think there are so many beautiful quotes in here. It's a really great look at humanity and how technology affects us and how society sort of affects us, how we need each other. And there's something so beautiful to be connected with all these different people through the internet or however you end up connecting with them. We get a lot of different POVs, and this book is sort of found family, so we get all the friends get their own POVs. Andy has his own POV as he figures out um, who he is after April's gone and who he wants to be as an influencer. He has all this sort of monumental social power now, and he doesn't quite know how to use it. Um, we get Maya's POV, who was April's girlfriend. Um, we get to see a lot of sort of her side of things, how April treated her. Um, we get to see some stuff about racism because uh, Maya is black, but she's grown up very privileged. So in a way, her really, her uh, sort of experience is different from many other people's. And I thought that was neat to see things through her eyes. We see Miranda, who is a, a woman in the STEM field in a mainly male field, and how she's handling things. And I just thought it was really fun to see all these different characters and their perspectives on the world and what matters. And I thought that Hank Green, one of the things that he does best is give characters their own unique voices. It was so much fun to read all these different voices. And the only one that I didn't really like was Carl because he was so scientific being like a robot type being. I, I didn't really enjoy his sort of history lessons and him talking about what he is. It was very heavy on the sci-fi aspect of things, which wasn't why I was reading this book. I do think it was a really good ending to the series, but I don't think it held up quite as well as an absolutely remarkable thing did. Um, I really liked the sort of virtual reality they introduced in this book, though. I thought it was really fun, but I do agree that it'd be very dangerous because I would certainly go in and never leave. I would be one of the people who doesn't come out except once a day to eat, maybe to shower. Um, I really liked how Hank Green explored what that kind of virtual reality could be used for and how there is sort of a way that it could be used for good, but it could also just sort of destroy society with how addictive and terrible that it could be. After that, I read an arc that I actually got from NetGalley. It was Down With This Ship by Katie Kingman. Um, so I was given this arc to review and I got through it this month. This was one of the books that I was excited for releasing this year. And after reading it, I'm not really sure how I feel about it. Um, so the general plot is that this girl is writing a fan fiction and she is very invested in this show and she's writing a fan fiction that's super, super popular. So popular that she ends up getting an award for it. She gets invited to a convention. And her whole life is sort of centered on this show that she feels is her thing. It's her show. And she's very invested in it, even though it's not popular. But she tells us it's not popular. And yet everyone at school knows about it and has an opinion on it. Everyone has a side in the ship war. Which is another thing that bothered me, is that the ship war is sort of like Twilight. So we have our main girl, who is Pippa, in this fictional series that uh, she follows called The Space Game. So the main girl is Pippa, and there's this broody man named Byron, and this other man named Cedric. So you're either Piprick or Pipron. And those are the two sides of the ship war. But you cannot tell me that everyone knows about this show, and there are two sides of the ship war, and there are no fangirls shipping Cedric and Byron together, because that would 100% be the most popular pairing. This isn't like a Twilight fantasy thing. This is a science fiction show. And one of the big things in the sci-fi community has always been shipping the male characters together, even if they don't really belong together, even if they only look at each other once and hate each other. There are fans of Byron and Cedric together, and I don't know why they're completely excluded from this story, because there's no way they wouldn't exist. There's no way everyone loves Pippa and wants her to be with either Byron or Cedric. There are definitely people who just want to write P Pippa out of the narrative and put the two men together, because that's what fangirls do. Is it a good thing to do? No, not really, because it excludes female characters, and, you know, those characters aren't gay just because they looked at each other once. But there definitely are fans that do that, and I don't think the whole school is split down the middle with just people who want Pippa and Byron to be together and people who want Pippa and Cedric to be together. Where are our gay ships? There's no way you have a whole series, and no one has, has invented a gay ship for it. It's ridiculous. The other thing is that I, I don't know if I 
I went to school during the Twilight Era, during the Hunger Games era, and there was never a whole school argument over who belonged with who. Not everyone was invested in it. For a show that's supposed to be our main character's special thing, the thing that only she really cares about, everyone is pretty involved. Like, this is maybe, like, it would have to be one of the biggest fandoms to ever emerge for a whole school to get all bent out of shape about who belongs with who. A lot of fans don't even get involved in shipping. And this whole school is involved in who is going to date Pippa. I just thought it was a bit of a ridiculous representation of fandom. I've never known fandom to be like that. Sure, there are ship wars, like obviously people get invested in shipping, but that's usually on the internet or at conventions. It's very rarely in school where there's so many different kinds of people and definitely not all of them are watching this one sci-fi show. It was just, and the other thing is that her fanfiction is so popular, everyone in the fandom knows about it, which I also think is a little, little silly. I've never known a fanfiction that was so popular, literally everyone read it and thought it was better than the original show, so much that even the creators and the actors read it. Fanfiction is still sort of new as far as being accepted by creators and actors. I remember a time when you would be sued for writing fanfiction. You know how people put warnings at the top of their fanfiction? That's because people would actually get sued and get cease and desist letters to stop writing fanfiction. It's not so widely accepted yet that authors and creators and actors would be like, yes, this fanfiction is better than our show that we write ourselves. We're going to hire this 16-year-old girl to write our show for us. It's, it was just such a weird way to represent it. I didn't feel like the author had really sort of looked into what fandom is like now, or if she understood fandom very well, or conventions for that matter. There's a scene at a convention where the main character just talks to her boyfriend while she's on a panel for like 10 minutes, and there's no way that everyone would be okay with that. People paid to come see you talk. You're not going to have a private conversation during your panel for 10 minutes and no one is booing you. And I just, I just didn't like it. And I also felt like the, the whole, so the main character is also in her own love triangle with this one really nerdy boy and this one jock, and they both seem fine and sweet. And then she just tamlins the jock. Like one night she just decides, okay, the, the nerdy boy is the right one. And also the jock has always been an asshole. No, he wasn't written as an asshole. And it was weird that she just tried to write him off as an asshole to avoid having any actual conflict about which boy was the best for her, just so we could be like, yes, of course. It's always been this one guy, the nerd, who's best for her. I don't remember the main character's name, or the two side characters' names, because they were so secondary to the fandom conflict. It didn't feel like there was enough time to develop them at all, and the relationships felt forced. There was so much going on. I just really wish they would have delved more into the fandom and worked that out better. They even include snippets of her fanfiction, which had such potential to be fun, but it just reads like the worst fanfiction that no one would ever be this invested in. Like, the, this fanfiction has been going on for years, it has millions of followers, and no one has kissed yet. There's no way that fanfiction is the most popular fanfiction in the series when it's got zero smut. You cannot tell me that's how that works. It just feels like there's a lot of fandom-centric stories coming out, and this one is just riding on the coattails of some that feel like they better understand fandom. Like Ashley Poston's Once Upon a Con series 100% understands what it's like to be a fan, how fandoms are involved with creators, um, what shipping is like, and this one just feels like it didn't quite grasp what those things are like in, the, in real life and not on the internet. It sort of just reads like the main character goes to a high school that's full of internet people. I'm not even going to get into that there's this whole like sinister plot to shut down her blog by classmates who are essentially villains, like mastermind villains who tell you their plans as they plan them. It was just really ridiculous. Like, I, 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 I liked some aspects of the book. I liked what it was trying to do, but in the end it was just not executed very well, in my opinion. The final book that I read in the month of February was A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Moss. Hate the cover, but I got the Illumicrate cover, so I'm actually gonna change those over and those will be nice. The actual story is a beast. It's quite long, and I don't feel like it needed to be this long. I also don't feel like Cassian and Nesta were the best characters to hold up a whole book like this. Um, so the tension is just really awkward. It's a lot of forced tension between the two characters who we already know want to have sex with each other. We, we know that they want to be together. So it's just forced. Like, there's just, oh, well, actually, I don't want to be with him because of this. 
And then they'll work through that thing and they'll be like, well, now there's this that's stopping me from getting closer to him. Like, a lot of it is just Nesta not wanting to say things with her words, so it's very frustrating to read and be like, you could just tell him that, Nesta, you could just say those words and your entire issue would be solved instead of making us read 700 more pages of this. And Cassian is just such a weird character to be in the mind of, because he is very simple. <laughs> I thought, like, when we read Reese, it's like, oh, like, he has all these, like, evil thoughts. He's sort of between sort of being good and evil. Cassian is very sweet. He's much more morally sort of directly good than Reese is. But he also just, like, thinks about getting hand jobs a lot and doesn't like to think thoughts that are too complex. So Cassian's whole thought process is often just like, oh, I wish I could be with Nesta. I love Nesta so much. I want to be with Nesta right now. And there's not a lot of interest going on up there. And this is what we have for 700 pages. I want to say that, like, a good chunk of this is just fanfiction level sex scenes, and we get little snippets of plot throughout it to sort of make it feel like it's still a story, and they're building up like they're gonna do a new trilogy, I think, starting with this one. I hope Nesta and Castine are not the center of the next book because I don't know that I can stomach that again. Um, but they're gonna do like a whole trilogy featuring this new villain who gets like, I wanna say like a hundred pages to build up like sort of, oh, there's this these magical objects we need to find. Let's do that. And also there's this new villain who lives in the lake and Queen Briallen is still an issue. And then the rest of it is just Nesta and Castian pining after each other. We get some scenes with Farrah and Reese um, dealing with their current issues where Farrah is pregnant through some very poor decisions <laughs> and they have to deal with that. Um, we get some Asriel content, which I really wanted from this book. I love seeing more of Asriel. He's such an interesting character. Um, we didn't see much of Elaine, which I wish we had seen more of her. In fact, I wish we had seen more of both of Nesta's sisters. It feels like they should have been more instrumental to her healing than just Cassian, who she literally just met a year ago. I feel like her sister should have been there for more of that. It was weird that they just sent her away with this man and were like, he'll cure her. He'll fix all her depression and self-harm issues. I do think they dealt with uh, Nesta's sort of healing really well. I thought that was a really beautiful part of the book, that she goes from hating herself, thinking she's worthless, and she develops friendships. I loved the relationship between her, Emery, and Gwyn. I thought that was sort of the strongest part of the book, that she develops sort of her own found family, like Farrah has, like Cassian has, and she has her own two friends who are like sisters to her now, and how they help each other through their issues I thought that was really good, and I wish we would have had more of that instead of just Cassian and Nesta throwing barbs at each other and then fucking for 10 pages and then going back to where they had been before that. It's just up and down. There's, It's not a progress into a relationship, it's just up and down until eventually Nesta uses her words and then the conflict's over. I still really had a lot of fun reading it. I think Sarah J Maas is really good at writing adult fiction. Um, she definitely doesn't pull any punches. There's a lot of stuff going on in here that kids cannot read. And I think she should have always been writing adult fiction because this is what she's good at. It was fun to read, but I only gave it four stars because I, I feel like it could have been done a bit better. And I definitely think with different characters in the lead or even more mixed POVs um, would have been more interesting than just Nesta and Castian for 700 pages. I cannot express to you how long 700 pages felt following just these two characters and the trials that they have essentially set up for themselves and refuse to conquer because if they finish it, there's no more story. So, eh, could have been better. I'm gonna keep reading this series, obviously. It's one of my favorite series. Um, I just hope that there are characters I enjoy more at the center of the next book and that the relationship tension is more from getting to know each other and not just from forced tension because we have to have tension. They can't be in love for the whole book because that'd be boring which is what this felt like. And I did read one manga this month, as I usually do. So it was the 26th volume of My Hero Academia, which is right in the middle of the uh, Endeavor arc, the Endeavor Agency arc, which I didn't like. I thought it was terrible. I hate the slow path they're taking to redeeming Endeavor, a man who kicked a toddler so hard he vomited. I don't think he needed a redemption arc, and I don't think he deserves one. He could die, and the series would be better for it. Um, I also don't really like following Deku too much. I don't think he has sort of a very interesting arc. He's a very 
basic shonen protagonist. He's cute, I want him to succeed, but when he's the center of the story for too long, I get very bored. Other than sort of seeing the Todoroki household and what the family is like, we don't really get much plot progression from this book. It's just a power-up book where they learn to use their powers a little better so they'll be more powerful in the future. And then we see a little bit of sort of Endeavor's home and what happened to his oldest son, and that's it. There's really nothing in here except starting Endeavor's redemption arc, which I don't support, and powering up the three main characters in Class 1A, which needs to be done. They need to power up to continue the Shonen series so they can keep fighting stronger and stronger villains, but it just wasn't a very riveting read. I thought it's one of the, like, lower ranked volumes, maybe one of the worst in the series so far. And I know that we're going to get into like the big war arc, which is too long, but at least has a lot of interesting backstory and a lot of interesting character conflict. So this is kind of just a waiting period between where we were before with an interesting arc, and then we get a little power up arc so that they can feasibly do something in the war arc that's coming up next. So those were all six of the books that I read in February. Um, a mixed bag. I really liked Addie LaRue. I think that was probably my favorite. It was kind of not a great reading month for me, um, but I'm moving into March and it's spring and I'm excited to start on all my new books that I have set out for myself in my spring TBR, which I will be posting a video about later. Leave a note below about what your favorite or least favorite book that you read in February was. I always love hearing people talk about the books that they didn't enjoy because there's always so much more to say when you don't enjoy a book, I feel like, than when you love it because um, there's always so many reasons that a book just didn't vibe quite well with you. And other than that, I look forward to seeing you all next week, and have a lovely day.